And uh, I want to express appreciation again to the steering committee of the Black is Black Coalition Social Justice, Peace and Reparations and, and to everybody who's here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, recount the significance of, of uh, what we've done up to now and, and uh, this particular school. I think it is the most uh, important school that we've done. I think that's uh, reflected in a number of things. Of course, the situation in the world uh, that's happening now that was just alluded to uh, by you, uh, Comrade uh, Sister Vice Chair, uh, what's happening in this country now. Uh, I see that uh, Trump appears to be using the same strategy uh, as we. Uh, he's determined that the, the trial has already begun, that the people are the jury. And uh, I don't know where you got that from. But... <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, one thing that we've, I think, uh, I've done perhaps more uh, effectively than any of the schools that we've initiated, and this is the eighth one, we've, this is the eighth year uh, that we've done the school, is to convey an understanding that this is about more uh, just an election, uh, just uh, 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 the current uh, uh, election season or Black people winning office. It's about more than that. Uh, that there's a whole history of our struggle. And we've had to struggle under circumstances that we've been thrust into uh, by our oppressors. Somebody came to Africa, and i never forget this, and I don't think any of us should ever forget it, that the struggle did not start uh, in Selma. It didn't start on a cotton patch uh, in Mississippi or, or uh, and, and, and it started at the very moment uh, a white man put his foot on the continent of Africa and forced an African to do something against her will. And we've been fighting ever since. And that's been 600 years. And I, I, I think that part of what we've done uh, relatively effective up to now uh, is to show <laughs> an historical trajectory uh, of uh, of uh, this process that leads us now to talk about elections. This is where we're locked. We're locked into uh, a process now where this uh, provides an arena of struggle uh, that we have to take advantage of. And I think in, in that context also, it's significant that uh, Comrade uh, Mukasa, uh, William Mukasa Ricks, uh, uh, who uh, is an extraordinary historical a uh, figure, uh, Comrade Afia Mungaza, uh, both of whom are from SNCC, Student Nonviolent Ordinating, or Coordinating Committee, uh, uh, that uh, represented that bridge uh, between that civil rights movement uh, and the African liberation struggle uh, that's still advancing today. I was a part of that process and continue to be a part of that process. And I've, I've uh, uh, taken uh, the lessons of SNCC uh, uh, and the develop the processes of SNCC and, uh, and, and, and and contributed to, I think, developing us to a situation now uh, where Black power uh, is being given even more definition. Because if you talk about uh, uh, power, uh, and that's the only thing that makes sense to talk about if you're involved in some kind of struggle, what is what is the struggle about? To what end? And how does power look? And uh, that's those are critical issues, and and the solving the problem uh, therein is what our movement has been up to, uh, about up to now. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, the question of power revolves in self-government. That African people minimally have to have the ability to govern ourselves. And when I say govern ourselves, I don't mean in some neo-colonial form. I'm not talking about like Eric Adams in New York or or the woman who is supposed to be the mayor here in, in uh, St. Louis, uh, or, or even the neo-colonial forces you see all over Africa. When we talk about governing ourselves, we're talking about being having access and control of all the resources of, of Africa, African people. And ultimately, we're talking about liberating the productive forces. That's what a struggle against colonialism is about liberating the productive forces. That's the that's what it is. We talk, uh, given it an economic uh, uh, context, an economic content is liberating the productive forces. And the politic that we have uh, uh, the, it is revolves around the struggle 
to liberate the productive forces. What do I mean by productive forces? I'm talking about uh, those things necessary to produce life. Uh, and, and that includes land, and land is central to it. You have got nothing if you don't control the land. And uh, the the expropriation of the productive for of the land is the first thing that the colonizers have done. That's what they've done in occupied Palestine. It's been done all over Africa. And then even at the point subsequent to the step of this land that we stand on today, uh, they have uh, continued this process of pushing Africans out. The whole ongoing repetitive process of land seizure and taking the land from the people who need land in order to survive because that's a critical component of the productive forces what are the productive forces it includes uh, those materials and things necessary to produce on the land and, and with the land uh it includes the implements of production but the most critical thing about the productive forces are what the people who produce and the struggle against colonialism is the struggle to liberate the productive forces. And that's part of what I think that a movement has succeeded in doing. And I, I, I really want to credit uh, much of this to the process and development that was born of this incredible, magnificent uh, uh, force uh, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the one of the most misnamed organizations you ever want to hear, <laughs> you know. but. Uh, uh, it, it represented that bridge from just trying to struggle uh, within and to improve our situation inside the system to the leap for our own power. And SNCC, whether it was conscious of it exactly or not, it was moving in that direction uh, when it said power, Black power, it stepped on the same terrain that Vietnamese and other people around the world had stepped on and took the struggle here uh, against uh, colonialism. That's what it did. And this was a powerful thing. My involvement in this, uh, we said uh, something about it yesterday. I met Mukasa in St. Petersburg, Florida. And Mukasa came to St. Petersburg, Florida because I had ripped down an eight by 10 foot mural that was hanging on the city hall wall. Uh, uh, a despicable, uh, dehumanizing entity, uh, and which is a part of the thing that we have to live with. We live as a people with humiliation. Sometimes it's so it's so common that we don't even recognize it when we see it. Sometimes, uh, but we live with humiliation all the time. Stopping and frisking is a humiliating kind of gesture. The police stop you, make the children sit on the on the on the curb. That's humiliating. Drop your pants. That's humiliating. This. Just all kind of in the classroom, yeah. you go to school, you learn everything. They say, well, we don't do it now. Like we used to say uh, 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 that uh, black people ain't nothing. No, they just say white people, everything without saying it. They just say, you get history. This is history. They don't say that. They don't say this is against black people, but everything they talk about is for white people, which means that everything else is working against us. So we live with humiliation. It's a great thing. Can't wear your hair the way you want to wear your hair. You can't do anything without the approval of the oppressor. So uh, I lived in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, it's really interesting because I, uh, uh, I was born in 1941. Uh, and yes, uh, the world was here back then, <laughs> uh, uh, a long time ago. And uh, I went to school uh, in an all African school. I'm so, I'm lucky because the damage always has been horrible in the school system, but these young people who we sent to school and white people, I mean, that was horrible. That was, and, and, and it's, it, they talk about the, the so-called segregation now as the worst thing that ever happened to us. And uh, even the NAACP's movement toward uh, uh, desegregation as it's characterized. Uh, 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 what was that? Uh, this, uh, what was that? Nineteen fifty-four ru court ruling. What was it called? Brown that Board of the, yeah. Say it again. Brown, Brown versus Board of Education. Education. I mean, they were using stuff. Uh, 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 and and the and the conclusion was that that uh, because uh, African people, children, seem to uh, have uh, uh, they they give African children the choice of a black doll and white doll, and the African would choose the white doll. Like the African children, children seem to be so far behind, and this is, of course, their social studies uh, uh, consequence. 
And, uh, and they concluded in many ways that a black child could not learn uh, if white children were not in the classroom, which is an extraordinary kind of thing. Uh, uh, that white people had to be present, which means that everybody in China should be behind. China shouldn't have a power because there are no white children there uh, and, and every place else. But this whole notion that we couldn't learn without being the present white people. And I, I, I quit school uh, in my senior year uh, when, you know, and part of it was a struggle I had with a very smart professor we had. He was a leading teacher there. And he made the statement in class uh, that uh, Black people would have to, uh, uh, how does he say, uh, somehow win the approval of white people before we could be free. And, you know, I had a real serious struggle, as serious as I could as a, as a uh, 12th grade and this he controlled the mic and uh, he was a really smart guy too you know much much uh, better educated than I and uh, that was a that was the kind of stuff that we lived with all the time the kinds of assumptions that we live with all the time the thing is that every you would hear all the time that okay integration is going to come and boy you got to get ready because you're going to be going to school with them white people them white they, you know they got they know everything and what a treacherous thing they did to us, what an undermining thing. And then, and then, you know, like the first time I went to school with white people, I had, I was in the U.S. Army. And I decided that, uh, uh, you know, I, I went and got a GED while I was in the Army. And then I decided I would take a, a course uh, from the University of Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. What do you call it when you're out of place? You know, when you, it wasn't, it was actually in place. It was actually, they actually had teachers and classroom and stuff like that. And it was on the base in Berlin, Germany, where I was sent. And, and in Berlin, Germany, on this base, uh, uh, headquarters, Berlin, and and there were diplomats and there were officers, white, all these white people there and officers and and I'm the only dark thing in the in the damn class. And the first day there, they gave a test just to see where you are and, and everything. And I would had the highest damn score in the damn thing. And, and these are diplomats, these are officers, you know, uh, et cetera. And they're supposed to know every damn thing. And so I continued to uh, have experiences that had me question over and over again. How the hell did we lose? <laughs> uh, but they, this notion that somehow, somehow, something conferred upon white people, you know, all this knowledge, all this smartness and everything, and then we we couldn't make it. So this was like part of our experience there. And I left and I went, I joined the army when I had just turned 18 uh, because, uh, you know, join the army and see the world. And because I was convinced that, uh, uh, nearly convinced that uh, part of the limitations I was experiencing being able to aspire had to do with living in this small Southern town, St. Petersburg, Florida. I can just get out of St. Petersburg and, you know, et cetera. It was, of course, it was ridiculous. It wasn't like that at all. And I could, you know, from the very moment I got on 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 the bus going to uh being inducted into the army and stuff you know i ran into nigger bashing you know by white soldiers who white people who were going into the army and uh but i was in berlin germany i was there when the wall went up when the berlin wall was there i was there i was in one of the first uh u.s military tanks that faced a russian tank in combat mode i was there i was there when as quiet as it's kept it was discovered that the big guns uh, on that uh, uh, that 60 ton of iron uh, tank uh, with the 90 uh, a millimeter gun, uh, that I was there when it's quietly when we were ordered to come off the off the 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 the, the intercoms and and meet in front of the tanks because they didn't want the the Russians to learn uh, that the damn big guns didn't work. I was there when they said it, it had an 11 mile range, but if you if you fired, it didn't work. You don't know if it's going to drop right in front of you or go, you know, any place else. I was there in Berlin, Germany. I was there when when uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy came 
uh, and talked about uh, declared himself. He he thought he was saying he was a he was a Berliner because he lived in Berlin. It been and Berliner, uh, which uh, translates uh, into I am a Berliner. Uh, but a Berliner was a jelly donut. So, but he didn't know that's what he was saying. You know, but uh, uh, but I was there when that happened, and uh, uh, and this is just something like fourteen years after the military defeat of German Nazism, like fourteen years after the military and the German Nazis both been the worst creatures on earth. And I'm in Germany, uh, and uh, and are uh, respected and treated better by Germans in Germany uh, than the America that I'm coming from, right? Uh, uh, except this was a kind of experience. This is opening up my eyes in a real world, and I ended up uh, 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 finally uh, being sent to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, and this would have been uh, probably, I was there probably 1962 uh, or something. And in Fort Benning, and, but while I'm in Berlin, uh, the civil rights movement is heating up. And probably Mukasa's problem causing problems and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and we listened to the radio that was coming from, because Berlin was uh, a city uh, Germany was occupied by, by it, it had lost the war. It was occupied by Russians, Americans, French, and British. And uh, Berlin was behind, it was in, was, 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 you had to go through uh, East uh, uh, territory, Russian territory to get out of Berlin. So we're listening to radio, I'm freezing. Never been, never seen snow in my life until uh, I'm coming from Florida, mm -hmm. uh, uh, until you know, I get into the military. And I really didn't believe that it was possible for human beings to live. I really, I literally thought this, humans cannot live under these circumstances. And so uh, I'm in this freezing tank. And so we listened to the music, the best music that we can listen to was coming from the East side, from Russians and, and, and the communist, uh, and they played this song. I think they, they said, this is a song uh, uh, by Louis Armstrong. And I think she said, the, the name of the song is Peace Down South. She said, but there has been no peace down south <laughs> since Mukasa got there. <laughs> but since the, since the struggle of Black people occurred. And, uh, you know, that was striking. What am I doing in this cold tank? Uh, facing Russian guns, right? Uh, uh, and the Russians, they never did nothing to me as, as far as I know. Uh, anyway, I get back to birth. They send me to, to Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning, Georgia was hell. In terms of, uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, uh, surrounded by these white people. Africans would leave the base on the weekends and 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 go into town and come back blooded if they come back to get going to jail and stuff like that this is just ordinary folk so that was pretty problematic for me uh i got charged by a white woman who was uh ran the 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 snack bar on the base uh because uh when i go to buy something and try to give her the money she didn't want her hand to touch my hand. So when I try to give her the money, she do like this. Every time I try to give her the money, and I do like this to make her take the money. So I got called to the base uh, by the officer and said, the white woman said that I was trying to hold her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was like the Sergeant Major on the base. Anyway, he didn't want to have that discussion much longer <laughs> after he said that to me. I said, nope, sorry, it's just not true. So I don't even like white women. I think white women look like fish bellies. And uh, and I start just started talking. He said, stop, 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 stop. But <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> and it, they sent me to psychiatrists and what have you because of, you know, uh, et cetera. So, so finally, I wrote John Fitzgerald Kennedy a 13-page letter. He was the president then. So I'm, I'm, I'm booking. I don't, I should not be here. I quit. I didn't stop going to work. I didn't, I didn't leave. I didn't leave the base. I didn't go to work. I uh, wrote Kennedy a letter and, uh, and uh, told him I need to be out of here. I'm not protecting you, protecting America, et cetera, et cetera, with the treatment of black people 
uh, and so finally they uh, uh, they said you 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 need to be out, and I said that's true, and uh, so they determined that they were going to give me a discharge, and so that was lovely. But the problem they had was the civil rights movement is going on. U.S. Army itself uh, is concerned about how it's being perceived. Uh, and uh, not only domestically, but internationally. Uh, so uh, they decided that they gave me a date for my discharge. And, and they said sometime within the, uh, the two weeks prior to that, they were going to court-martial me. <laughs> Because why are you discharging me? I mean, my record is great. You know, uh, I'm what they would call a good soldier. I knew how to soldier. You understand? So uh, why are you discharging me? So they came up with uh, with uh, three thing, things that happened. They said it happened six months prior to that because they want to discharge me and they want to give me, they want to uh, uh, criminalize me and then kick me out of the army under those terms. So anyway, they, 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 uh, they they brought me before a court martial and uh, you don't win a, you know a military court martial you don't win those uh, but I did <laughs> and I did because I organized one of the problems I had was I had begun writing pieces and posting them on the bulletin boards throughout the whole battalion about the condition of black people the contradiction with black people et cetera et cetera and they didn't know they knew it was me because they could tell my attitude. I mean, I'd be walking to the mess hall and I see the first sergeant and I say, hey, sergeant, that's, you know, I do what you're supposed to do. I say, killing the babies late and keep moving, right? And so, uh, I mean, I was just attitudinal. I mean, I was serious. They, they, uh, 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 this guy, I forgot his name now, he called me. And everybody knew, Africans knew my attitude, right? And they, they said, uh, uh, I'm walking across, they said, Walter, come, come here, come here, come here. And they said, and tell the white boy, uh, tell him that joke. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear the one about, I think I heard the one about your mama. <laughs> you know, I mean, so so this is, they knew who was doing this stuff, putting this stuff up. Uh, and they sent, you know, so they got this search going on to find the culprit, right? The evidence of who it was that was doing this stuff. And finally, um, you know, for they concluded it was me. And they, they, uh, they, uh, I beat the charges that they had put on me, but I had gone to beat the charge. I had, I had organized all the Africans in the battalion to be witnesses at the trial because I'm trying. I'm defending myself. I'm not taking their lawyer. I'm defending myself. So I said, all I went and got all the all the Africans to sign up to be my witnesses in the trial. And so here we sit up there all day, and all these Africans coming through. And I'm contaminating the attitude and the opinion of every black person that's in this in this military outfit there in Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, after the, <laughs> and I'm laughing all during the thing. So after it was over, they, they called me and said uh, that this uh, captain and said, uh, <laughs> said we find, we find you not guilty. And uh, said thank you. I saluted and bounced out. And when I get downstairs where all the brothers are. We all high fiving and laughing and everything. He looks out the window. He sees us, <laughs> and he calls me back upstairs. He says, "I know you did it." <laughs> he said, "But I can't prove it. I couldn't prove it." I said, uh, "Is that all, sir?" <laughs> he said, "Yes." I said, "Thank you," and kicked out on him. You understand? And back. Out and they put my ass on a on a truck on the armed guard <laughs> and took me, you know, off the base. So, you know, this is, you know, like part of the process of my own organizing experience. And uh, uh, I get back to Florida and then, you know, begin to organize there and on, a, on the ground there. But stuff was happening everywhere. And uh, Africans were engaged in struggle, the best we know how to struggle on every front, you know. And uh, so my, a point that I would make is that, uh, that when we talk about the electoral thing, it should not be understood uh, as just getting somebody elected. Right. The way right. people understand running for office, 
like this is it, you know, the elections, the electoral, no, 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 no. The elections process was something that African people moved into as a way uh, to forward the struggle to be free. And the question is, did we get free at any juncture? That's the question, the outstanding issue. Not did Jumba get elected, but has that contributed at all to our freedom? That's why we can, you know, uh, applaud uh, Jesse Todd and Charles Barron because it continues to forward the struggle to be free, not because he got elected. And if he gets unelected, this has impacted on the struggle to get free. And so, you know, I, I really wish Charles was still there, et cetera. Uh, in some ways, I think he, I think they liberated him, to tell you the truth, you understand, and gave him a much bigger platform. But the point is to get free for the whole people to be free and not just for Charles Barron to get elected, to have a post there. We're not trying to get him a job. We want a job to go pee in the bottle just like the rest of us have to do to get a job. But the whole question is to advance the struggle for our liberation. Don't you think that's what it's about? And when we talk about reparations, do you believe that this enemy will easily uh, offer up uh, what uh, the resources back that is done to us? We're going to have to have everything we got, even the vote. They didn't give it to us. We took it. And in the final analysis, in the final analysis, because, because once you calculate the amount of value that has been stolen from black people, once you calculate the amount of value, that's why I'm always concerned about the formula that they want to use. Uh, no, uh, like a... American born Negroes get it and this kind of stuff. You know, what the hell are you talking about? Africa, you know, there wouldn't be an American born Negro if an attack on Africa hadn't happened. There's an American born Negro because Africa came under attack and black people in this country are part of the resources that they stole from Africa. And, and, and when you talk about that, uh, I just think it's really important. This is what we're talking, what is the name of this coalition? The Black is Bad Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparation. Hey, back, James Brown, you understand, so to speak. So I just think that uh, it's important for us to really understand that. We're going to talk a lot today about how to, how to pursue uh, these offices and how to pursue some other things within the electoral process. But it's really important for us to understand that our objective has to be free, has to be to get free. And uh, we use, as Malcolm X said, any means necessary. And Malcolm X uh, was open to the electoral process on our own terms to advance the struggle to be free. Yes, sir. So um, thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, somebody who's really concerned, we got a jam-packed agenda, and folk are really concerned that uh, I'm acting in a very indisciplined way, and uh, they're telling me to get off, and so somebody else can get on. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, let's move this forward. Had a great, great, powerful uh, uh, discussion on yesterday that set, set it up for the process today. Helps to arm us to understand the urgency of this moment uh, and why it is that we have to win and why it is that, that gives significance to the things that we're going to hear from Charles Barron about door to door winning the war and the things that we hear from Comrade Jesse Todd but how to get elected, uh, it's going to give urgency and, and greater definition to that. Thank you very much. Uhuru.